Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, we will wait for uh, one or two more minutes because still people are uh, are coming in. We'll be right back. Okay, we will uh, kick off now. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today uh, we have a, a webinar about online and decentral collaboration uh, and what effect that has on working with Blue Dolphin and architecture in general. Um, let me see if everything works. Yeah, I guess so. Um, my name is, uh, is Jelle Fischer. Um, I will be presenting today. Um, I've been at Value Blue for the past six years. My current role is uh, CCO, um, from which I'm responsible for our commercial teams. Um, and next to that, I have a, a very a big interest in, in, in enterprise architecture and the effect uh, and the impact you can make with it on, uh, on, on organizations. Um, with me today, I have Mart Hoogvliet. Mart, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, if it's, you can see me now. Um, hi, I'm Mart Hoogvliet. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I work uh, with, at Value Blue with Jelle in uh, the commercial team. Um, you'll see me uh, pop up uh, every now and then during uh, the webinar. When you have certain questions, I will ask them to Jelle. Um, and we'll see how many questions come in and if we can go through them all during the webinar. Uh, don't worry if your question won't be answered during the webinar because there are a lot coming in, then you uh, will get a private message uh, from me to answer your question. So uh, have a lot of fun, I would say. Thank you, Mart. Um, so I will proceed with some introductions about the webinar and, uh, and, and how to ask questions. Uh, I will turn off my webcam in order to uh, to preserve some uh, some space on uh, on the bandwidth, um, and uh, and focus will probably be on the slides and the and the demo, even well. So some practicalities. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can do so by clicking the the question mark icon on the right side of your screen, uh, and then just stop typing the, the question. Uh, it will pop up in Mart screen. Uh, and then Mart decides if, if he, he will ask the question right away or uh, will save it up for afterwards. Um, next to that, I, I will want you to engage in some in some polls. Yeah, there you are on screen, please. Oh. Let me see. I think you can see it now, right? Yes. Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, perfect. I'm sorry. So, some practical and practicalities. Questions can be asked by clicking the question mark icon on the right side of the screen, typing your question, and then Mart will process that question. Um, we also would like to engage you in uh, well, exactly two polls. We will ask you a question. Uh, as soon as I've been asking the question, you can answer it via uh, the multiple choice. Um, I will get the results and we can discuss them afterwards. Um, if you would like to engage, I would really appreciate it. We'll, we'll make the we'll make the webinar a little bit more interactive. Um, and after this webinar, we will send you a replay of the webinar as well as the slides. Uh, and we also kindly ask you to give some feedback uh, so that we can constantly optimize everything that we do based on your feedback because we provide you with the best content that we can. So. Then let's proceed to the content. Um, we're going to talk about online and decentralized collaboration with Blue Dolphin today. Um, I think specifically in these times where we work from home, um, where it's harder to to be in touch with your colleagues, um, it's interesting to see how we how we can still collaborate. And also, what we see is a, a lot of change going on in the world. Um, people working more decentral. Um, the power and innovation is more decentralized. And what effect is that going to have on the architecture function uh, in the company? And how can we leverage all that knowledge that we have in the company uh, to make architecture more relevant? So the agenda, uh, well, the introduction, we already did that. Um, so I will proceed with 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 um, diving into the question: What is enterprise architecture, and why do we do it? Um, then I will zoom in a little bit more on traditional EA. Um, I will then zoom in a little bit on the agile methodology um, and basically just decentral working methodology, and what impacts that will have on the new role of the of the architect. 
Um, and, and afterwards, I will show some examples in a demo of Blue Dolphin um, to, to give you some, some practical examples of, of how decentral working affects architecture um, and what you need to, to be ready for that. So what are the core tasks of an enterprise architecture? Well, what we see in companies is that, that we have executive teams uh, that define the long-term business objectives. Where, what, where do we want to go with the company? Uh, how, how do we want to transform? How do we want to evolve? Um, but these objectives are mainly very high level. Uh, they're, they're based on, on, on C-level uh, perspectives. Um, and, and it's really hard to interpret them and to translate them to projects. So one of the core tasks of the architecture teams, specifically the enterprise and business architecture teams, is to translate these objectives into a strategy and a roadmap that is much more tangible. Um, this trans strategy and roadmap are leading the transformation of every organization. And, and one of the biggest or transformation that every organization is going through right now is, of course, the digital transformation. But basically, the change within a company and the moving forward can be can be named as a transformation altogether. Um, so the architect defines or, or or gets the business objectives from the from the management uh, and, and the executive teams. He translates that to a strategy and a roadmap, and then uses that strategy and roadmap to lead the transformation of the company. Well, what, what does that look like to make it a little bit more practical? Um, examples of, of objectives usually defined by, 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 by teams in the, in the executive board, for example, are, oh, we should provide a best, better customer experience, which, which is a very real goal, but it's still not very tangible. Task of the, of the, of the architecture teams, for example, is make it easy to do business with us on mobile devices to provide a better customer already makes it much more tangible. Um, you can also think out about reducing operational IT costs, which is still very vague. Um, the, the architect then translates that to projects, to initiatives um, that can make that more tangible. For example, the transition to the cloud. Um, how can we innovate, create new offers, become data driven? Um, and one that we hear very often as well is pay off technical debt, um, which usually translates to replacing le legacy systems in, in, in some way or another. So what does the enterprise architecture business do? Well, basically, it translates the business objectives to a strategy and an execution as a, as a big translation part, um, and then guide your organizations through the changes necessary to execute those strategies. And those changes are actually, the, the guiding of those changes is very hard because you have to do with information about business, you have to do with information models, process models, technology models, all sorts of, of, of information. Uh, mold that together in one roadmap and then being able to align all that and to integrate that, all that into one fitting strategy that is both fitting the needs of the management team and, and, and basically fulfilling the business objectives, but is also understandable and manage, manageable by the rest of the organization, specifically the operation. So why, why do we have an EA function to do that? Why, why do we do that? What, what, does it, what value do that, does that deliver? Well, the first one um, is minimizing risk. Um, that means you can do impact analysis by defining a roadmap, um, by getting all the information that you need. You can do impact analysis of the changes that you make. And by doing those impact analysis, you can reduce the risk of making mistakes. And next to that, Architects set up, set, set up governance structures in which they define company policies, in which they define uh, the compliance with standards, uh, making sure that all changes comply with the rules and legislations that we have to comply to as an organization, um, reducing the risk for, for all sorts of things why we made those legislations. Next to that, architects make sure that those strategy and roadmaps are effective. Um, they prioritize projects that support the objectives so that they make the most impact, that they, that they are being done at the right time, um, that they are not construct, obstructing or influencing each other. Um, and they increase the business impact by focusing on the business objectives. So they are basically the gateway between the operation and the strategy to make sure that the operation is the, is, is, um, the workforce that is really um, realizing the objectives and not working on things that don't contribute to that value. And last but not least, 
uh, we want to become more efficient, more quick as a company. Uh, so by defining a roadmap and then giving all the information needed to execute that roadmap, we can realize faster delivery by having all the information ready in one place. Uh, and we can minimize overlapping functionality, for example. Think about, for example, application portfolio management. If all your applications are in the end functioning to realize business objectives, um, you have a very efficient, uh, the least complex application landscape possible. But you can think of the same for processes, for capabilities, anything. Well, this is the point where I want to ask you a question. Um, and the first question is, which of these tasks that an enterprise architect should have, which of these responsibilities is more most important, do you think, for your organization? Is it minimizing risk? Is it being more effective or is it being more efficient? Um, I think I just launched the poll and you can answer it now. Uh, I will give you about 30 seconds to answer it. Um, I'm curious, what do you think? What is most important for your organization? What's the biggest responsibility of the architect? I see some answers coming in. I will wait for 20 more seconds because a lot of answers are still coming in. Okay, I think we are there. So the results of the polls, we'll close it. I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, I can read it out loud. 50% of uh, the attendees have answered with optimizing effectivity as the most important responsibility of the company. 33% uh, says minimizing risk is most, uh, most important. Um, and 70%, 17%, says increasing efficiency is the most important role of responsibility of an enterprise architect. Uh, can definitely imagine optimizing effectivity um, as being one of them, the being the one that architects at least can have the most impact on by prioritizing the projects, um, supporting the, making sure that they support the objectives. Uh, you can make a huge difference if every, if every project that you do is 5% is more effective um, the difference that makes for your whole portfolio of, uh, of projects is huge, of course. The same goes for efficiency. And I think minimizing risk is also very important. But there's a lot of teams around that responsible for that as well. So uh, I think it really depends on your organization. Well, interesting results. Let's go on. So what does the traditional architecture function do? Well, first, planning. That is that translating that business objectives into a strategic plan. Um, the, the actual activities that you then have to do is create a current state architecture of all IT and business systems, uh, your East architecture. So what do we do, not do now? What are our capabilities, processes, applications, data objects, infrastructure, uh, everything you can think of that, that logically ends up in, a, in an architecture. And then you want to have a future state of where are we going? Um, and usually, in traditional architecture, um, these leaps are quite big. So we have current state and we have a future state and then a roadmap between the two. So we do a gap analysis, analysis and then we get from current and future state in, 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 a, in a very structured roadmap. We have then have to define and prioritize the projects and deliverables in such a way that they are most efficient in realizing that roadmap and define the rules and guidelines for the organizational transformation. So which company policies do we have to deal with, uh, which rules and regula regulations do we have to deal with. And th those are the basic activities that you do in planning. Um, then we proceed to the execution and the ex execution, the architect is usually responsible for the correct execution of these plans, aligning and dividing the initiatives over the organizations. So for example, a new capability has to be created processes have to be brought in place, then, then the IT has to be created or optimized for those new capabilities. And the architect looks around, 
analyzes the company and, and divides these tasks over the company uh, so that everything is carried out in order. And then, of course, every design that is made um, is, um, is evaluated by the architecture board and that ensures that it's in line with the compliance and governance standards, company policies that were set up in the planning phase. So, so this is what the traditional enterprise architecture function looks like. Um, so what, I, what I'm curious about now, that's the second question uh, that I'm going to pull you, is do you really believe that if you start working more decentrally and if you're going to do your decision making more decentrally, does the, that these there's these activities that an architect is responsible for are going to change during um uh and are going to change if you're going to work more decentral so then i'll go to the second poll and you can just simply um answer this with yes or no so do you think that working decentral and or agile affects the role of the architect and specifically uh the things that we that that, that we lined up here uh, creating a current state, future state architecture, gap analysis, ensure compliance with governance and standards, and so on and so on. I think the poll is now being distributed. I will wait for another 30 seconds for the answer coming in, for the answers coming in. I see that 20% of the people has voted now. Gives me the time to take a sip of coffee. Okay, 10 more seconds. Okay, and I will close the poll. So we are there, a lot of answers again. Um, and what we see is that nearly everyone indeed thinks that if you're gonna work more decentral, more agile, that these are uh, activities are gonna be affected. Uh, only 8% says, these these activities are not going to be affected. Um, well, the rest of my my uh, my presentation is is about how the function is going to be affected. So I was hoping for these answers, of course, um, and and I'm really glad that everyone well agrees with with my views on this. Um, let's proceed. So the um, what what we see if if I speak with Arctic architects, which I which I do quite often, is that ensuring that strategy and execution are aligned with business objectives. It, it, they say it's a huge challenge and it becomes more and more challenging every day, um, mainly due to two reasons. Firstly, the high complexity in, 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 in medium to large organizations, we talk about tens to hundreds of projects, um, hundreds and, and usually even thousands, sometimes even 10,000s of people. And if we then look at the assets that we're managing, Think about applications, all the CIs, all the, the processes that we have to manage in an architecture environment. We we usually fall, talk about 10,000s, 100,000s, and, and, and I've seen an example with, with millions of assets. Um, and assets is then everything, applications, relations between applications, CIs. And the complexity makes it so hard to manage from one central place that it's usually not doable anymore. So you just skip doing some things. Um, and then next to that, there's a development um, that, that has a lot to do with Agile um, of democratized decisioning, meaning that the decision model is no, no longer fully top-down. Uh, it means that most organizations, they want to leverage all that knowledge that the smart people have um, within uh, their organization. So you don't want, just want to give them tasks to carry out, but you want them to think and to come up with ideas that contribute to that roadmap. So it's not a one-way traffic anymore. Um, and those two things make it much harder to have that classic approach of business objectives from the board, than an architect or an architecture team defining a roadmap and then having the rest of the organization carrying it out because it's either too complex and thus becoming too high level in the roadmap. Um, and it and it doesn't really invite for 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 um innovation from the rest of the company from the people working for your company oh. so what does the traditional enterprise architecture function do well we, we just discussed that um and in the traditional world what, what does that lead to what does that lead to in a in a complex and changing environment and a bottom-up environment well 
if the if the world is around you or, uh, and the world of your organization is too complex architects cannot keep up with the speed of modeling due to the complexity and the rapid change of the organization so it gets really hard to keep track of your current state architecture specifically if you're just drawing in in physio and every viewpoint that you create is just for one sp sp specific perspective and for every new perspective you have to draw a new model um, then your end state or your future state uh, usually in traditional EA we look a year or multiple years ahead and create a future state for that uh, and then next to that we have a future state for every project that we do a current and a future state um, meaning that you have a lot of different drawings again probably you cannot keep up with the speed as well and next to that especially in those long-term multi-year multi years um, um, future state architectures um, it's very hard to do adaptation to changing situation. Uh, it's it's so hard to adapt those views because once you created them uh, and you want to adapt, uh, you have to change all the views under that. Uh, it's not dynamic. It makes it really, really hard. Well, if your current and your future state are based on the wrong data, you can, of course, do a gap analysis. Um, but the gap analysis is, is, is worthless if your data on current and future state architectures are not right. Um, makes it really hard to define and prioritize the projects as well because you don't really have reliable data to define okay which parts of this company do we have to improve um, and what we see is because of the complexity and because the architects take an approach where they they define their roadmap and their future states on a higher level they get really hard to understand for the rest of the organization um, means that you get a top-down approach that that doesn't really work um, and then next to that, we see that by defining the rules and the guidelines for the organizations, um, the, the architect sets them out and waits for the um, designs for the projects for the future states to come back from, for example, the solution architects and then, uh, or, or from the development teams. And we see then that the architects are being skipped um, because they, they uh, define that the, that, that the design is not compliant with any of the legislations that were set out. Um, and because of that, they are not in, um, they are seen as a um, as slowing the process of innovation down. Um, they are seen as the one that always um, that are always being nitty gritty about details about this guideline about that guideline. Um, and in the execution, uh, we see that um, aligning and dividing the initiatives of the organization gets too hard with too many projects, specifically to do it by one team that is not involved with the operation. Uh, we can also see that it's really hard to make sure that all initiatives uh, are aligned and integrated with each other. So how does one in, uh, initiative affect another one? Uh, if we are both working on the same piece of infrastructure, if we are both working on the same piece of applications, um, how does that affect each other? Does it make sense to do it at the same time? Uh, and if you don't have an always up-to-date insight in your current and future state, it's really hard to align that. Um, yeah, and in the end, just as I mentioned before, architects are going to be skipped by the operation because they are not able to innovate rapidly enough. So easiest solution would be like, okay, let's throw architecture out and just work agile. Um, but of course, um, I don't think that's the solution because what happens to the benefits that we mentioned before on the previous slides uh, if we start working agile, because we said, okay, architects have respons architects have responsibilities. They are there to minimize risks, to to make the organization more effective and more efficient. But if we're just going to work agile without architecture, um, we we cannot minimize that risk. Uh, we you know, risk becomes even even higher um, if we have decentralized teams all working autonomous, all working on their own projects, and there's no centralized overview of all those projects. There's no centralized overview of the current state architecture. How are we going to know what's happening in the in the company? Um, and if there's no architecture function, how are we going to make sure uh, that all those projects and all those new technology is going to comply with the rules and legislations and that our data is not going to end up somewhere that we don't want it to end up? Uh, well, basically, there's no governance on that. So it's probably going to go wrong at some point. Um, what we also see in, in an agile environment is that projects are being prioritized on an individual level, um, multiple risks on that. Uh, I don't personally don't believe that one individual 
can have all insights in what the priority of projects is. Uh, and next to that, everyone has his own interpretation on the prioritization, meaning that projects are not aligned and that is going to affect effectivity of those projects. Um, and you're going to have a, lot, a big risk of missing the insight for road mapping. So how do projects follow up each other? Uh, how, do, how are we going to align all those different autonomous teams working together? Um, and, and on the level of inefficiency, uh, we see that if you start working autonomous, the risk is that you constantly uh, start reinventing the wheel. People think of solutions that have been built before. Teams are working agile, autonomous. Um, they start thinking of solutions. They can do a lot by themselves, but the risk is uh, that people don't work together between those teams, just in those teams themselves. So what is our solution? Well, I think if you can see my mouse moving around, I'm not sure. Um, but on the upper side, we see traditional EA, which is basically a very long-term roadmap on, to come from current to future state. Um, but if the future state changes along the way, it's really hard to, to get to that desired uh, architecture. And usually we end up at a place that we don't want to end up, uh, um, that, that we initially thought that we would, would like to end up. But along the way, we realized that, that the desired architecture was actually somewhere else. Well, then we have Agile without any architecture, without any guidance. Uh, and that's basically just a lot of autonomous teams doing things that they think is right for the company, but they don't have the information uh, and, 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 and the uh, authority to actually define what is right for the company all by themselves, uh, meaning that all projects are running in some way uh, or another way, but not there's no really real co coherence. Um, because there's no translation of the business objectives. So what you want to work to as a company, what I think is the optimum solution is what we call Agile EA or a Decentral Enterprise Architecture. And that basically means is that we set out a minimum set of guidelines of rules of legislations that we have a central platform in which we can manage our current and future state architecture with minimum um, impact on the architect but that we do use those platform and platforms and that we do use the, the knowledge um, of the enterprise architect to guide all that, and that innovativeness and all that um, 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 authority within the teams towards the desired architecture and that we, we are being able to steer that a little bit. So the innovation still comes from the autonomous teams that have a little bit of, and that have enough space to come up with their own ideas, to uh, interpret the roadmap any way they want. Um, but from the sidelines, we see that there, that there is a need of an architecture function that sets out the rough guidelines on how to innovate and where we're going to. Um, and that is adaptable, meaning that information is easy to interpret. It can be looked at from multiple levels. So how do, do we translate that? What do we need in order to get to that point where we can do agile architecture? Well. It starts off, I think that's unmissable, and that, that's why we started creating Blue Dolphin, um, is you need a shared central repository that describes the key components of the enterprise architecture and how they relate it. Basically, you describe your company, um, meaning that you define, okay, what are our company's goals, the purple box on top? How do we execute or operationalize them in projects? Those projects that need designs, those designs are worked out in, in, in classic architecture objects or, or in any way else. And then every design is taken up in the master branch, in the master design um, that becomes your current state architecture and also describes your future state architecture based on all the future state project architectures that are there. And then based on that, you can realign your business goals, projects and designs. And this is an ongoing cycle. So you have your projects, you have your master branch, your master architecture, which concludes or um, involves your whole architecture, both current and future state. And you constantly use that master branch to re redefine your goals, your projects, your designs, and your roadmap. Um, and the architect is right in the middle of this. He constantly needs to govern this process, to orchestrate this process between the operational teams carrying out those designs uh, and between the strategy level that creates the roadmaps and the, um, the goals. So in order to do that, Architect sets up a governance framework, includes everyone in the organization, 
um, to make sure that information is kept up to date and relevant. Uh, and, it, and, and, and in the back constantly orchestrates all that information. So what do we new, need from a tools perspective? Um, we need tools and integration to ensure that the report story is always up to date. So that means that we need to be able to integrate with the other systems within the organization, like BPMM tools, data tools, uh, service desk tools like ServiceNow, so that we can touch that operational data that is already being um, uh, kept somewhere else. We need distributed access. Anyone in the organization needs to get into the tool uh, and keep their part of the information up to date. And we need easy polling for getting information from different stakeholders. So it's absolutely required that the user interface is so easy to access and so easy to understand that you don't need to speak architecture language to keep your part of the information um, up to date. And next to that, we need easy management of the assets in multiple levels of detail. So that means that you need to be able to define processes on a very high level uh, to just describe what you're working on, to describe capabilities. But you also need to really dive in, into that so that you can use it on, a, on an operational level. Um, for example, for the implementation of a, of a new application or a new um, a piece of infrastructure. You need to know exactly how a process works or exactly how an application works on detail level. And you want to then be able to aggregate all that information um, uh, to a higher level so that you can use it for strategic purposes again. And that there's no gap between your operation, operational information and your strategic information. Um, and then you want to be able to have current and future state architectures being able to do gap analysis and do that constantly. So it's not a one-time acquisition, but you want to be constantly available and constantly capable of doing that and realigning all your projects, realigning your roadmap. And then last but not least, you want analytics, reporting, and evaluation possibilities over all that information. You want to be able to evaluate your project designs, your current application landscape, your future application landscape, your capability map uh, in a very easy way on compliance. You want to be able to do impact analysis, portfolio rationalization. Uh, you want to have insight in your projects and in your timeline. So basically what it becomes is a central repository to manage the progress of everything you're working on from an architecture perspective. And that really involves both strategic decision making and operational um, uh, operational excellence, because the two cannot live without each other. How are you going to make your strategic um, decisions if you don't have the real-time information about your operation and how things are running? Uh, because you're then making decisions based on the wrong uh, uh, perception of things. And how are you going to carry out a strategy in your operation if you don't have direct access to that strategy information? So. Then I want to show some real life examples in Blue Dolphin of how we can operationalize this. Are there any questions so far, Mart? Yeah, Jelle. Um, that was a lot of information, of course. Uh, I haven't seen any questions come in yet, but maybe it's good to uh, wait a minute to see if people have uh, questions open uh, till this point, uh, till we go to the demo of Blue Dolphin. Yeah. Yeah, I will not exactly be a demo of Blue Dolphin, but I will show some examples of yeah. them. Okay. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, let me check. Oh, if I see it right now, it's been a very good story till so far because uh, nobody has uh, any questions. <laughs> then I will proceed to Blue Dolphin. Yes. Can you see the Blue Dolphin environment right now? Yeah, we can see your screen. Great. So to start off, um, I think uh, most of the people attending are familiar with Blue Dolphin in, in, in some way. But what we see here is um, um, the uh, 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 the buildup of an organization in Blue Dolphin. So we have business goals, we have a value chain and an operating model. Those translate in a business capability model, a process architecture an application model, a data model, and an infrastructure model. And basically your business goals, they define your value chain. So what do you want to reach and how are we operationalizing that? 
Your value chain defines the business capabilities that you need in order to be able to carry out that value chain. And you have processes that realize or implement those business capabilities. And then you have your IT and data in order to be able to carry out those processes. And then you have a set of projects that constantly works on all these elements within your company so that you can constantly um, improve based on your business goals. That's basically how, how we look at a company from an architecture perspective. Well, one of the things that I've been talking about is the level of detail um, that you focus on. So on a very high level, um, in this case, we focus on uh, uh, an energy company. And on a very high level, a company looks like this. So what this energy company does, if we zoom in on the value delivery chain, is they do marketing and sales. That marketing and sales, if a new com com consumer comes in, um, they, they do distributed energy services. So basically, they do decentral energy services. Then they have to generate power and trade it. And they have to do the transmission and distribution of that power. Um, then they have to manage the customer's energy. And then you come into the customer care um, part of the, of, the, of the value chain. Um, and in the end, that's the whole cycle um, of delivering intelligent, secure, and customer-centric transactive energy. So basically, what they describe here is a is a value chain in which you get something like a sun cell on your roof. You can start creating energy. You can then um, bring it to the grid, and at the same time, you're also consuming energy from that grid. Um, and that's basically what this custom or company does. And in order to be able to do that, they have suppliers, they have different locations in which they create energy, they have organizational uh, um, uh, resources needed, they need information resources, and they have a management system. So this is usually on a high level, on a management level, how you describe a company in an operating model. And in order to be able to define this, we create a capability model. So then we operationalize this into capabilities. What should we be capable of as a company in order to be able to carry out that value chain of what we deliver? And what we then see is that we have some capabilities that, capabilities that are in the, in the value chain themselves. We can see them here, distributed energy service, customer care, power transmission and distribution customer energy management, sales, marketing, those are the exact same capabilities as we saw in the value chain in the previous image, but they are defined on a more detailed level right here. And what we see is that the company cannot live with these capabilities alone because they need supporting capabilities in order to be able to carry out all processes around that core value chain. So they need a finance and risk, HR, IT, and a legal department and a portfolio department in order to be able to manage sort of the company around that value chain. So what we see here is from a very high level, what does the company do in a value chain in just six or seven blocks to a more detailed level where we describe everything the core organization needs to be capable of doing. And then we detail that even more into sub capabilities. If we then go down even more, we end up at a process architecture. So what processes do we operationalize in order to be able to carry out those capabilities? And what we then see is that we have, oh, I will turn on the colors, is a flow of processes, managing marketing campaigns, onboarding a prosumer, produce and trade electricity, store and distribute electricity, and then the billing process. And if we zoom in even more, we can all see all the sub processes within those main processes. So for example, onboarding a prosumer, as someone who, do, who both produces electricity and consumes it, exists out of answering questions, then registering a new prosumer, and then supporting the config, uh, configuration and installation of a smart device. And then we can zoom in even more and that's where we really get to that detail level that we need in operation in which we can exactly see how this process is being carried out. So we see that we have registering a new prosumer that's carried out by the department's prosumer and customer service employee. We can then see that it starts after answering the potential customer question and that it ends after uh, ends with supporting the installation and configuration of the smart device. 
and then we can see all the tasks that we have to carry out in between. In the blue bars, we can see which applications we use um, to be able to carry out this uh, this process. Uh, so basically, we need all the operational information. If we were to change anything in this process in order to optimize this, this would be the kind of views that we need to be able to do that. But what we want now is to be able to leverage all that information that we described in those extreme detail levels of a BPMN view to be able to relate that to the higher levels. And that's one of the problems that we see happening in very in many companies is that, well, if you describe this in, in a non-dynamic visualization, you would have a BPMN view, then a separate high level view, and maybe you would create a view of a value stream, but there would be no way to integrate your BPMN view uh, with your value chain, for example, without doing a lot of drawing work. So what we want to do here is leverage that information in those worked out BPMN processes. So we worked out the ones with the green squares on top of them. And we can use all that information that we described here in the visualizations a level higher. Oh, click wrong button. So what we see here, for example, is that we have support installation and configure the smart device. If I open that view, we see that some applications are used here, for example, SAP, but also SOE Web Service and uh, Liberty Energy Portal and some more. And because I described that in my BPMN view, Blue Dolphin is directly capable of showing which applications are used in which processes because we already described that in a bpmn view and blue dolphin can interpret that information and then make it visual with a conditional or a color view and here you see the integration of the bpmn level and a higher level process description uh, all in one view so we don't have to make two visualizations which hugely increases your efficiency and then also makes it viable to do it. If you'd be a, if you'd be working for multiple days on creating um, the insight between the BPMN views, the applications used, and then your higher level views, you would probably not do it. You would not operationalize your process plans to that level so that your projects could be carried out. But because we make it so easy, it gets much more easy to manage and you can give much more people access to that information, making working decentrally more practical. Uh, we can then filter on that and for example if i want to know which applications use the liberty energy portal they light up if i want to know where sap is used they light up so you can filter really easily we cannot only filter to a more detailed level we will also want to be able to filter to a more high level so we want to know which capabilities are implemented by these processes so why do we have these processes we do these processes in order to be capable of doing what and then with one click of the button we can show the relation between the implementation of the capabilities so for example if i want to know okay which of these processes help us to implement the capability of marketing it's managing marketing campaigns and all the involved uh, processes which processes are involved with sales we can see that the onboarding process involves two processes answering questions and registering prosumers that support the, pro and the, the sales capability. We can then see, okay, there's also one for customer care. So the whole onboarding process uh, supports two capabilities. And basically we can just click through the model and light everything up like this. We can see exactly which processes are used to implement which capabilities. And then from those capabilities, of course, we can see which of these capabilities are directly related to the value chain. Well, those are the ones in the value chain. And we can also see that in our processes. So if we zoom on in on the processes again, we can here directly see um, which processes are involved with the key value chain. We show the relationship between a business process
which is associated with the value stream. And then based on that, we can see that nearly everything, except for registering a prosumer, I don't know if that's right, maybe I just forgot to fill it in, is involved with the value stream, with the core value stream. So you can really leverage that information and use it to make visualization on all different levels without any extra modeling work or extra uh, work for your architecture um, organization. And I think it makes the work much more interesting because you're focusing much more on analysis uh, than on simple drawing and modeling. Uh, you're really using that information to make decisions. Well, the next one is, and that's one that we see often as well, is that if you start decentralizing, at some point you want to centralize it over again. And most companies, they don't look as simple as this. So the, the, the main overview is as simple as this, but most companies look more like this. And if we look at this, is that um, we see that business goals are defined centrally. There's also a central value chain and operating model, and probably that also means that you have central business capabilities. Well, this is a little bit discussable, but most companies then have different domains, different locations. So think about your different business units. Think about the different countries that you and that you operate in. Uh, think about the different offices that you have throughout the country, and those offices they all have their own process architecture. They all have their own application models. They all have their own projects to um, improve something, but they usually, did this, this depends on the company, but what we often see is that they all work from a central infrastructure uh, and a central data model, for example. Um, and this is what makes it really hard, because if we would have, in the, in the old architecture world, if we wanted to improve something here, or, we, or if we wanted to get insight in what's happening at one organization, and then being able to compare that with one of the different business units of domains, that would be very hard because we ha would have to create millions of models. So, well, maybe not millions, but dozens of, of models. So what I can do here is I can open an application model. So this is a very simple application model of, of domain A. We then have a very simple application model of domain B right here and we see that domain or business unit whatever you want to call it c also has its own application landscape but one of the things that i would want to do um, if i had a company that was di distributed like this is i wanted to give those organizations some authority themselves so i want to distribute the power and want to give them the ability to model their own application landscape um, but I would not want to separate that from the other domains. So what I want to do is I want to let them model something like this, but being able to sort of aggregate that and from there then orchestrate that and start harmonizing things. Because you want to know, okay, where do we use separate um, um, uh, applications and where do we use different applications for the same process and where do we use the same? And maybe we can do it all with the same applications, making integrations more easy, those kinds of decisions. So what we can do here, we model this out and we can see, okay, all these applications are in domain A and I can do all analysis, analysis on this. Okay, what kind of functions do they have? Um, I can see, for example, okay, um, where are they hosted? Because those people, they fill that in themselves. They model out their application landscape and they said, okay, if I click on this application, they have properties. And those properties are being filled in because we've asked them to fill that in, but they can model it out themselves. And one of the things that we ask is, what is the hosting, on-premise, external, SaaS, public? They fill that in. But now as an enterprise architect for the whole company, I want to know how does this compare to the rest of the organization, of course. And a very easy way to do that is to basically just integrate this into one central um, architecture so what we see here so we go back to the previous page i can directly see here which applications so i basically just pushed all those of those domains together on one view and just with one click of the button i can see that these applications so for example if i click on sap i can check for its relationships and what I can see 
is that there exists a relationship between the location domain C and SAP. What I also did is I, I actually uh, connected it to, to physical locations, but we will focus on this one. So SAP is associated with domain C. And because I know this, I can now start filtering. I can just ask, okay, which domains are using this application? I can say there's a relationship between application, which is associated with a domain. Let me see, where's my domain here? Click on OK, and just with one, with a few clicks, I'll be able to see, OK, this part of my architecture is running in domain A, this is running in domain B, and this is running in domain C. And I, of course, this is a little bit oversimplified because in most companies, you would see a lot of overlap, multiple domains using the same applications. Um, but I think it gives a very clear view that you can, again, decentrally describe your application architecture and you can do the same with your projects. You can see this, do the same with your, applica uh, with your processes. And then on your central views, with just a few clicks, integrate all that information in your central view and be able to manage and to recognize that. Um, yeah, and from there, uh, optimize your organization, both from a decentral and a central level. And of course, you can do the same for your projects. So right here, I go back to my view. You can see, for example, that every domain here has its own project overview. So if I go to um, project overview domain C, we can see that there are some applications in here. You can then ask, okay, which projects are running on these applications? And we can see that we are implementing an ERP system here. We can optimize a CRM system uh, and we are optimizing a CRM system. Those projects are going to affect my SAP, charge me and Salesforce application. And because I define that in my lower levels of my organization, I'm again able to aggregate that information and go back to my central overview and can ask the same question there and we'll see it in a more complete overview. So if I now, again, in this application view, want to know all my projects, all my different um, domains centralized in one overview i can basically just ask which projects are running here and the system will show you that there's not only an implementation of an erp and an optimizer of crm which by the way hits, hits more applications than we just saw because we have a more complete overview but there is also an iot outroll going on in my whole organization so we can get again get a more central overview so we have five minutes left um are there any questions so far about this? I can imagine the question being, okay, very nice. These are the few points that I want. This is how I want to integrate my information. But how do we get to that information? Well, I will show you one example after this. Um, but also please um, notice that, that we have limited time. So I'm showing you the results. Um, if you're interested in seeing more or seeing more in depth how this works, uh, we are always happy to schedule a, a personal demo with you in which you can which we can all answer your all your questions in a one and a half hour session. Um, there came a few questions in Yellow. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is quite an interesting one. Uh, Chris has asked us uh, which experience do you need with modeling languages uh, like Archimate for uh, Blue Dolphin? And I think also uh, it relates to another question that uh, stands here. Um, you've shown us a lot of applications, a lot of information which uh, resides in Blue Dolphin. How do you get all that information in Blue Dolphin? Who's responsible for that? Yeah, well, th those are some very good questions. Um, I will give the short answer. For the long answer, uh, uh, I'd be happy, as I said, to schedule a call uh, to explain a little bit more because uh, it's quite an extensive answer. But the short answer is, okay, in order to manage this data, 
um, I think it would be very useful to have one person in the organization that understands what architecture is. So usually we see that you need someone in the organization that manage and manages Blue Dolphin or, or your architecture ap application, and that basically orchestrates all that information um, and has to understand what the relationship means. Those things are, uh, I think the language in itself is not the most important part. You can learn that quite easily. Blue Dolphin involves all sorts of tricks to make it easier to understand. So for example, we have labels. I can see, oh, this is an application by labeling it. I can see, okay, what do these relationships mean used by flows information to sense information to those kinds of things. Um, that makes it easier, uh, but you have to understand on a basic level how you create, uh, what a capability is, um, how you create relational models, those kinds of things. And then the, the, the assembling of the information, um, we try to do that in such a way that you don't need any architecture uh, language. So of course, for example, yeah, if you have solution architects, then they create solution architecture of an application. Oh, and it's very useful if they know a modeling language. So if they do understand, for example, it's connecting, that if you dive into this application and you wanna know how its solution architecture work, works that that person also models that out in an architecture like language and here we can use all sorts of shapes so we can uh, turn on editing we can see that we have Glowema here that that lands on an infrastructure that has integration with other application that supports some functions so if you do solution architecture for example it really helps if everyone is modeling following the same standards because because of that i can now integrate all this information to that level above that. But if you're not really modeling, then I think architecture knowledge is not necessary because what we can do, for example, is if I click on an application and I wanna gradually extend the information about I, and that application that I have in my platform, I can use the questionnaires. So basically I can click on this application, a pane will show up and in this pane, I can add all sorts of information. And this information is just asked in, well, what, what we call human language. So I can ask that hosting, but we can also do that, this more structured. So what I did, for example, if I wanna do application portfolio management, I wanna know which applications we have, why we have them, and if we still need them, um, we can, for example, do it like this. So I ask, okay, who is the owner of the application? Who is the admin of the application? And those are grayed out meaning that that information comes from a different source. And I can then check the source and see that it comes from our Zendesk application, our service desk application from which we got this information. So no modeling needed here. We integrate with other systems, get the information centrally, and then use that information uh, in the fields to fill it. And because of that, we can now filter on all the application, for example, managed by person A, B, or C with the same colors or with the same analysis as I showed before. But what I also do is I ask, okay, in which locations is this application used? So first I define the owner, then I ask the owner in which location is, is this application used? And I, I expect the functional application owner to, to know in which locations an application is used. And they can just choose from a pick list. So basically they can choose all the sites that we have in the world. And because they fill this in, what happens is a relation is created between the application and the locations that we see here. And those locations can then again be visualized. And um, what's, uh, what's perhaps a good follow-up question also, uh, you shown us um, there is information which comes from a program that integrates with Blue Dolphin. Um, I have here a question, uh, are there integration possibilities with uh, program license program snow yeah yeah so uh, snow is is a great source of information uh, we love to integrate with that uh, snow is really good at scanning everything that's happening uh, on the technology level in your company and then relating it via their database to the functional applications um, which is very valuable uh, information that we can then read in and it sort of helps to to, to do a large part of your infrastructure to applications uh, architecture uh, automatically and keep that up to date 
uh, very easily. Yeah, so that's a great source that we definitely integrate in with, and that, that makes Blue Dolphin much more valuable. Yeah. So right here, we see that we showed all the locations being used from that source directly. So we don't have to fill in anything. Was there another question, Mark? Sorry. Um, yeah, well, this is, this is quite an extensive question, but uh, perhaps you can give the sh uh, short answer. Uh, Marshall has asked us, how do you roll this out in a bigger organization? Uh, do you start with one team or take a top-down approach? How do you implement Blue Dolphin? Um, yeah, it can be both short and long answer, but um, the real short answer is depends on the company. Um, what I personally prefer is to... Because I think the goal is not to model out your whole organization. The goal is to model out or have all the information available that you need to carry out the projects to realize your value stream and your strategy roadmap. So what I like to do to roll this out is to integrate Blue Dolphin with the running projects um, and start work, uh, working those projects, projects as if you've been using Blue Dolphin for always. And with every project you do, you gather information and ba you basically um, um, support the information model. You're building it up. So every time you do a project, you do an ERP implementation, you have all that information about applications, integrations, how they support processes. You do that in Blue Dolphin. You do your solution architectures, your designs, your process designs. You do it in Blue Dolphin. And then in the next product project, you can reuse all that information you use for the ERP implementation and start doing your CRM implementation. I don't know any project that you have. And if you do multiple projects a year, tens, twenties, hundreds, uh, you will see that your information model starts being more and more complete by the week, which is a very interesting thing, while at the same time realizing a lot of practical value by working in a structured way. Okay. Okay. So well, last thing. I to show we have these we, we define these application owners we ask them in which locations is used and we can ask them more and more so i have a new tab which processes are supported which functionalities are supported which actor is supported and i can basically just fill in these questions then some financial information Italy information and along the way if i create a new application an information model is created so i will create a new application that has no information about it. So if I create that application right now, you will see it has zero relationships. But for example, just by filling in these questions, I will just randomly click some things. You'll see it already lights up with support some processes. So we ask which processes are supported by this application. What functionalities does this application have? All, all questions that I think an application manager should be able to answer. Which department is using this application? And just by asking these questions, I have created an argument model. So if I open my diagram now, you see, hey, there's an architecture model in which test new app one has all this information, where it's used, which functionalities it has, which processes are supported. I can directly use that information in my color views or in my conditional views. So if I now create a new conditional view and ask, OK, which processes are supported by this application, simply by filling that in, I can see that it's used in process trade of electricity and in the process billing process and so on and so on. So really, it, it, it forms all that information into one single repository. And I've never used any modeling up till now. And I can just show it with color. So I think you don't need to know modeling uh, or architecture modeling or argument uh, as a user of the platform or as an operational um, manager of information, but it's very useful to have one central person. You can then distribute all these questions via our guest links, basically meaning that I can create a guest link and send this in bulk to anyone in my organization by an email address, and then they will just in their email get this step of information. They won't even see the modeling. Um, they just answer the questions, they sign it, and by signing it, it will automatically end up in my environment and you can start using it as the architect. So I think this was it. Um, I'm also running out a, of time. I have one last question, Jelle. <laughs> I think one last question and then uh, we round up. Yeah, perfect. Ah, okay. Uh, it's another question from, uh, from Chris. Um, 
he says he can imagine that a lot of uh, processes uh, are being modeled at a high level um, and he has asked if there's a possibility uh, to attach a certain document with uh, detailed um, with details uh, about uh, work instructions to a certain process. Uh, yeah, that's possible. So you can basically just model a high level process, then add a document to it. And then at the point that you're going to use that process, for example, in a project, that would be the point that you use that process uh, description, model it out, and then you can aggregate those in that information to more higher levels. And you can do your impact analysis again. But up till that point, it's perfectly possible to attach a document to the high level process. Uh, all right. Okay. Uh, then I think uh, we've answered all the questions. Thank you very much for uh, everyone uh, who has asked a question. I hope uh, you had a satisfactory answer. Yeah, and I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, well, as mentioned before, um, I can imagine this being a lot of information in just an hour time. I, I, I ran over time, seven minutes. So, but um, but yeah, I can imagine you need some more time to process this to to ask questions. So feel free to contact me after this demo if you want any more information, uh, both existing customers as well as, as, as people not working uh, with, with Dolphin yet. Um, next to that, what we did is we wrote an ebook about agile architecture, um, which is freely downloadable on our website. Um, so if you are interested in that, you can download it. We will mention it in the mail that we see uh, send afterwards. Um, and if you are, Oh, this is not going the way I want. And um, so if you want to know any more thing about the upcoming webinars, because we have a lot more, check our website. You can find them there. Uh, and the last thing that, uh, that I want to ask you is, is please evaluate me. I really appreciate it. If I get your feedback on my presentation, uh, was I talking too fast? Was it perfectly right? Was it too much information? Uh, do you need more information? Please let me know. Uh, so that I can optimize for the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.